Good morning and welcome by Daisy Plenera Vegatering. Good morning <laughs> and welcome to this second plenary of the European Health Management Association annual conference online through the lens of Rotterdam. You see that my Dutch is getting better. <laughs> so um, uh, because we're through the lens of Rotterdam, you'll see a lot of themes of, of the Netherlands. And uh, I hope you're getting to feel that, that buzz. We've had really great partnership uh, with people in the Netherlands. So thank you everyone uh, for that. I'm George Valiotis. I'm the Executive Director at the European Health Management Association. So let's now focus on this session. The topic of this plenary is managing sustainable and resilient healthcare systems, strategies to facilitate the response to increasing healthcare needs. When health systems are unable to respond to healthcare needs appropriately and efficiently, people can be left vulnerable. So what do health systems need to do to be resilient and sustainable? European health systems have already been facing growing challenges as they try to address aging populations, multimorbidities and chronic diseases, while also balancing increased costs of healthcare and shortages in the workforce. Managing health systems that are sustainable and resilient requires adaptability to fast changing environments, making the best use of limited resources and addressing growing the health demands to provide better and safer care for all. Healthcare leaders must show a deep knowledge of the pre-existing context and strategic thinking and adopt novel approaches that are forward-looking, inclusive and able to spread widespread consensus. So to help better unpack that and really build our understanding, we are truly honoured to have an exceptional panel to lead us through this discussion. I encourage you to be part of that exceptional discussion um, by engaging in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You'll hear from our first uh, keynote for about five to 10 minutes. And then we're gonna go through the panel for about an, uh, maybe an hour of discussion um, through each of the speakers. So you can ask a question at any time in the chat box and the panel might be able to do a written response if that's appropriate. Otherwise we'll come to all the questions at the end. But also at the end, you'll be able to put your hand up if you prefer to do that. And we'll come to you live. And you can, if you've got your microphone and video switched on or just your mic, you can ask your question live as well. So do keep your questions coming. So let's officially begin. And to set the scene, I'd like to introduce you to Case Smith. He's a patient advocate for the Dutch Patient Alliance for Rare and Genetic Diseases. Hello, Case. Hello. Thanks for joining George. us. Good morning. Good morning. So um, over to your, to your presentation. Okay, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Ima for the invitation for a keynote for this symposium. And secondly, I would like to thank all the healthcare personnel in the European Union for all the efforts they made all over this year for people with COVID. This is absolutely strongly appreciated by the European patient community. And uh, I think it's maybe needed to introduce myself a little bit more. My name is Kay Smit. I'm almost 70 years old and I was born with a severe type of hemophilia, a blood clotting disease. During my life, because of my hemophilia, I got a number of side effects, which were foreseeable, avoidable, and unintended side effects, which caused that now I'm an aging person with multiple chronic conditions. Almost, I'm now almost 50 years active in the international patient community. And it's uh, therefore, and maybe Chiara, you can show my first slide, that I recently published my autobiography Surviving Hemophilia, a road trip through the world of healthcare, in which I described what I experienced in healthcare um, the last 70 years, but also my involvement in policy issues, especially the trade in human blood plasma. In my next slide, you see my circle of contacts within the healthcare sector and the way I try to manage all these contacts as a kind of a self-manager and as what we call in Dutch eigen regie. In my personal life and that of my parents and family, I went to a number of life-changing events. When I was born, there was no treatment for hemophilia. So my life expectancy was limited. Once a treatment became available, my life expectancy became normal. 
that was when I was 16. When I was around 30, 35 years, my life expectancy was threatened again when hemophiliacs had a risk to develop hepatitis and HIV through their treatment with plasma products. And indeed, I got infected with both viruses and not many people expected I would survive. Thanks to the development of effective medicines against HIV in the mid 90s and for hepatitis about five years ago, I can now speak to you with my 70th birthday within reach. And I think you can now skip uh, this uh, slide for a while, uh, Kiara, thanks. So you could probably imagine that my family and myself went through a roller coaster of emotions during my life. And maybe this roller coaster can be compared with the roller coaster the international healthcare systems went through with COVID-19 this year. And this roller coaster of emotions is something everyone in the international patient community is familiar with. And to a certain extent also everyone has learned how to live and how to deal with these emotions during their life. So for me, the COVID-19 was something of a deja vu of the period I went through in the 80s and 90s with HIV. Uncertainty and adaptation to new risks of COVID this year, and this time as a socially transmittable disease where social distancing is, let's say, the new thing uh, in this new world order. For me, the COVID-19 crisis reaffirmed a number of already underlying issues in society which are closely connected to patient issues. First of all, Europe should be much more self-sufficient in the production of raw materials for medicines, protective materials for healthcare workers, and with regard to strategic resources like blood and blood plasma. And therefore the European Union should collect much more plasma also to treat more possibly patients with COVID-19. For hospitals, the implication is that they should be willing to pay more for these products, for these products instead of looking for the cheapest products from all over the world. Secondly, COVID builds further upon already existing inequality in assess to care between the north, south and east-west dimensions of Europe. And therefore, large discrepancies in life expectancies between higher and lower social classes as a third point. As a fourth point, COVID has shown that the most vulnerable groups in society of this new pandemic all over the world are people with multiple chronic conditions and the elderly. And finally, COVID makes clear that there are underlying factors which makes people more, much more vulnerable for COVID, like undernutrition, overweight, diabetes, etc. And in my in opinion, the implication of all this is that the European Union should strengthen their grip on the healthcare policies of the member states. It was good to see that the new commission already has more attention for health compared to the former commission with the Juncker scenarios where healthcare played a minor role. And this definitely switched the scene nowadays. More grip from the European Union is not only needed because of more coordination on COVID policies and resources all over Europe, but also because of more involvement in relation to sustainability of healthcare against the background of climate change. It is also here that the European patient community can contribute a larger role by using their peer support groups to provide their peers with a much larger effort to educate them on the possibilities of a healthier lifestyle and healthier food. COVID has made it especially clear 
that changes in lifestyle, let's say the consumption of less salt, sugar, bad fats and volume can contribute to a better resistance to this and new emerging viruses. Also healthcare personnel can play a stronger role in creating a healthy nutrition environment within hospitals and other healthcare settings, not only for patients, but also for the visitors and the healthcare personnel themselves. An example from the Netherlands are the hospitals that provide six times a day, a small protein enriched meal for people with undernutrition or cancer instead of three meals a day, which is often too much and not specific enough for the needs of people with undernutrition or cancer. And recently we built a website with short movies in which through questions and answers, we handle recovery issues for people who have stayed for a long period on an ICU unit, including those with COVID. Also with recipes demonstrated by a chef cook on how to prepare at home meals, which contains all the building blocks for a personal recovery. And maybe we have to transform our first line clinic, clinics and hospitals to health homes instead of hospitals. So in conclusion, COVID has enlarged existing differences in healthcare assess and inequalities in society almost over the world. For patient groups all over the world, this must be a wake up call to attract much more attention on issues like lifestyle and through healthier lifestyles contribute to a more sustainable world. And this closely relates to the climate policy of the European Union formulated in the from farm to fork strategy. And I would like to close with a quote from Rudolf Virgov, and maybe Chiara, you can show the quote also. It means simply that we have to be much more active politically to shape a society that is better suited to the new needs of society and Virgov mentioned that as politics is nothing else than medicine on a larger scale. And with that quote, I would like to come you in action, not to do some exercises, but to do some work on the longer term. And therefore, I would also like to thank you for your attention. So. Thank you, Case. That was a great scene setting. And thanks for really situating us in what we should be always thinking about and focusing on. Um, so. What I want to do now is turn to the panel. And um, so we've got a panel of six and um, they're all going to give you a different perspective. And we're going to start with Joseph Figueres. He's the director at the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And Joseph, you guys have been a great supporter of our conference and you've already had many great sessions. We've had your book launch last night and we've had another, your session today about um, measuring quality. And so today you're going to talk to us about resilience and what is resilience? And all of that uh, in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, you George. Can have six, you can have six minutes if you like. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, George. Uh, thank you, colleagues. What a pleasure to be here today. You put a tall, order, a tall order today. How to ensure health systems are resilient and sustainable is really much at the core of this session. So what I wanted to do exactly is give you the briefest of understanding of resilience and then perhaps signpost what we believe in our research, in your research, in our shared research, what are the main key avenues to actually strengthen that resilience and therefore the sustainability of our health systems. And I like to highlight that. So first, what's resilience? Actually, yesterday, if I may say so, we had an excellent session in EMA uh, with the Commission, OECD and my people in the observatory actually defining that and bringing together all the amount of resources around what's resilience, how to measure, and how to use it to strengthen our health systems and its sustainability. So the definition, I'll, uh, then I will post some of our resources, some of our publications about resilience, about health systems. We have a website which is monitoring the response of health systems, comparing and drawing lessons. 
So resilience, we define it as the ability of health systems to prepare and manage, prepare and manage, absorb, adapt and transform and learn from shocks. But uh, uh, while resilience has become very sexy, very attractive during COVID, it's just a shock. And what's very sad is that we haven't learned much from prior shocks. We were not prepared. If you look at the index of pre preparation for pandemics, the best countries were, guess which ones? The UK and the US. And you then say in a society that these two countries have done that well with COVID. So we haven't quite learned about being resilient with shocks. And what's surprising is how little surprising is what we're learning from COVID. And case, your presentation was absolutely impeccable. Your 50 years of hemophilia, your reflections were at the very core of what I wanted to say. By the way, congratulations, Case, by your excellent volume. I almost read it already. So thank you very much for sending a copy to it, an electronic copy. Everyone should have access to it. So what is surprising, Case? Case said it very clearly. The EU dragged his feet, its feet. Now it's getting its act together. 11th of November, we saw a whole host of suggestions to deal with COVID, to deal with resilience, to deal with sustainability. But at the beginning, it wasn't the EU. It was the member states that didn't allow the EU and the European Commission to move as fast as it should. Does it ring the bell? Financial crisis, migratory crisis, migration crisis. Is it surprising that are the vulnerable the most affected? Who are the, the most affected in the last two crises, in the financial crisis? The vulnerable. Why? Overcrowding? Not funds to be able to stay at home and, uh, and follow any quarantine. No funds to access to tests. No incentives. Overcrowding, as I said. Isn't that surprising? The surprising thing is that we still find that surprising. Is it surprising? In case, I love it, your, 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 your quotation. Politics is health and health is politics. Is it surprising in times of crisis? Evidence, research, policy and politics becomes all one. Is it surprising that populism, when at the popul political populism while at the full front of the COVID? And actually the beauty, th beautiful thing about COVID, about the virus, is one of, the, of those health conditions, is one of these health system conditions that ignores populists and they have to reckon with realities. So what's interesting is that COVID is just yet another shock that is uh, uncovering the vulnerabilities of our health systems, of our international coordination, of our lack of protection for the vulnerable, our key challenges in terms of national governance, coordination, human resources, flexibility, the ability to search. One reminder, resilience, it's not just about good performance of systems, it's about the ability to search, to transform, to work very quickly. And the second part is still within the seven minutes, I believe, I wanted to highlight few strategies and then my colleagues much more learned than I am will probably go in more detail. Most of the strategies we learn about this resilience and sustainability are around governance, about the interface between knowledge, science, policy and politics, We've seen lousy examples of that and good examples of that. We've seen the intersectoral governance we talk so much about failing. Unclear, is it the Minister of Health? Is it the Prime Minister? Is it the Army? Who communicates? No political consensus leading to poor, uh, poor compliance of the population to poor trust. Not very transparent communication, which is key for following key in many health promotion areas, as Case was reminding us, clear, transparent communication is fundamental in health promotion for trust and compliance. We've seen all these problems within, um, within COVID. Again, lack of inter inter international cooperation, European cooperation, although now with this new, although the Commission certainly, when it's got the space, got its act together, Emma, not only your Emma, George, but the European Medical Ag Agency, ECDC, BARDA, which is now is called ERA. So there are lots of interesting strategies we can talk in a minute. The second area, which I'll hear much more, we'll hear much from our colleagues, is the human resources, the search, the incentives, the ability that our human resources have reminded us
to create new skill mix, the genuinity in which they have worked together, they have searched, the way that some countries have, some haven't, to be able to, um, to, to search, to train, to get new workforce capacity has been key. The finances, the purchasing flexibility, the reallocation of resources, the ensuring that there are no barriers. Still, there are countries in Europe, you have to pay for your test. For the love of God, do we want to have a financial barrier to access the test when we want to take population perspectives? And very importantly, I wrap up here, uh, George, is the delivery. Those countries who didn't have a good public health infrastructure in place, surprise, surprise, haven't been as good at testing, at tracing, at tracking. Uh, some countries with less of primary care haven't been as good. So again, in the area of delivery, we've seen a lot of developments, the use of IT all of a sudden within a week, we saw IT uh, uh, mechanisms, telemedicine, uh, e-health records being adopted, incorporated financial incentives. So we saw a lot of that genuinity as well in uh, the delivery, in the flexibility, in the pathways in that area. But most important than all, than all, and being here today is very, very important to say, is the community involvement, the passion involvement. And the question at the end of all that is, are we now able to draw, to harness for this last shock? So we're finally ready for the next shock. Are we able to harness these community resources, this special involvement, these this, 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 this human resources that work, that work so committed and so effectively? Are we able to harness this in a new IT, this energy, this ability to work together across member states, this ability of beginning to communicate? I'm trying to be very constructive and positive today. So this is really the key question, because to remind you, I am a member of the Monty Commission. I'm part of the scientific board. I'm the, the co-chair scientific board. The Monty Commission, which is made of a number of, of ex-prime ministers and so on, with a double edge now, is trying to address what is fundamental today. And I'll stop here finally, George, which is to remind ourselves that if we don't have health systems resilience, we will not have sustainable societies. Now, our policymakers have understood that resilient health systems are key for the sustainability of the economy, for the sustainability of well-being, for the sustainability of, of, of our societies. Are we able to take advantage of that? Stop here. Thank you, colleagues. Wonderful. Joseph, what a spectacular summary about the overall perspective of, of what's happening at a political level. Um, so let's, let's, let's get right into it and draw a little bit deeper. We also have with us today Mirella Minkman. She's the CEO of Villans, which is the National Center of Expertise in Long-Term Care. She's also Professor of Innovation of Governance of Integrated Care at the University of Tilburg, and she's a member of the board of the International Foundation for Integrated Care. And so, Mirella, can you talk to us about what kind of approaches and skills are needed in order to, to take action? Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, invitation uh, in this, uh, this lovely session. Yeah, there's a very important uh, questions which you are addressing and uh, uh, unfortunately there are no uh, really simple answers, but I would like to share some reflections and some ideas about uh, what you were uh, asking me. Um, Chiara, can I get the next slide? Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you very much and also especially to uh, Case and Joseph who really set the scene in this uh, uh, very uh, uh, an interesting era we are now living in. Um, and also, I think, Case, you perfectly demonstrated what is uh, very important and what's an important vision to look at the current situation. In my opinion, you really demonstrated your personal view, but also your personal life and your context you are living in, which is very important for what is in your situation, good service, good support, good healthcare, so what's needed. And you made the relation to uh, you call them underlying factors like also the, the climate, uh, food, living, housing, and things like that. And that's, I think, very important. Because from my point of view, what this uh, COVID period also really reflected is that without resolving fragmentations in our healthcare systems, we won't good, get good quality outcomes and answers. Uh, that's, I think, what's really have been demonstrated. 
And in my view, and what we also learned from the previous uh, years and the, the body of knowledge we have, is that an important starting point is like case demonstrated, is seeing people and societies in their needs, which are broader than care. So in my opinion, this COVID crisis is not a, only a health issue, but it's a societal issue. And Joseph also, in other words, demonstrated that the inter interrelatedness of things. And if we won't start with that broad view, which you can see in this figure uh, in the blue circle at the top, so that's a one, because it's, in my opinion, it's a starting point, then um, uh, uh, we won't uh, have a good further um, uh, uh, development of our healthcare systems. And we know quite a lot about how, what we could do or what we can do. And you see that in the, the, the bottom or the circle on the right in the green, uh, we know and we have quite a body of knowledge about how can we organize and support care around people, all kind of team-based approaches, uh, network approaches and things like that. Uh, we have seen in a lot of countries, and we know that's kind of the basis to organize our healthcare systems. But on the other hand, we also know, and I think that's something we should really uh, reconsider, is how we design and further develop our healthcare and social care situations and systems when we look at it from another perspective, which I would like to address, and that's the perspective of scale. And by scale, I mean a third development about what can we or should we organize uh, um, uh, as kind of healthcare solutions and approaches on what level? So for instance, in the Netherlands, some years ago, we had a transition or a reform towards more responsibilities to the municipalities. And we do have quite some municipalities in the Netherlands. Um, and we learned now that it's very good to see if that kind of scale is the right scale to organize support. You can uh, reconsider um, when I think we further develop health systems, what should you organize on a local level, for instance, in a neighborhood? How can you build up really bottom-up communities, strong supportive communities, which is very important? What should you organize on a more uh, local level, uh, for instance, in a municipality or broader area? What should you organize on a regional level? So what's uh, the right scale for that? But also, what could we or should we do on a national level? And so when do we need also international connections for our health and support? For instance, to start at that international level, uh, we as the Netherlands uh, needed the support of Germany to uh, care for our uh, uh, ICU patients with COVID. So the rethinking of scale, what do you do in what scale, especially in times when there's scarcity, scarcity in money in resources in staff, we should really reconsider that. And I see also developments in some countries who are working on that. And sometimes you see movements also from uh, central to more decentral to recentralizations. We see that, for instance, in the Nordic countries. If we do so, I think we should, and then I come to the, uh, the, uh, the purple circle on uh, the figure, we should rethink what should be the role of healthcare professionals, but also healthcare organizations. I think we should have made we should make a, a, a switch towards not thinking about how can we deliver good outcomes as an organization, but in what way can a healthcare or a social care organization support and contribute to a societal issue in healthcare? So, what can, for instance, a hospital, or whatever organization, contribute to an uh, to an um, issue in society? And if that's the role, and if that's the task of uh, whoever uh, contributes to uh, uh, health or social care, then there is a shared responsibility about uh, issues in society where we should contribute to. That means also other kind of governance, more shared governance models, where you have together the responsibility for the health and social and well-being of people. And that's quite a shift. If you uh, also for a CEO of a specific organization, to uh, refocus to the, uh, the, the outcomes of your own organization, to really contributing to an issue in society. So that's on the left side of, uh, of the model. And that's also a shift, uh, I think, um, uh, where uh, should be worked on. But that's not the only thing. So Tiara, uh, oh, no, wait a minute. Um, so that's kind of uh, how I look at what are some challenges uh, we are facing in a uh, lot of countries. But also to make them happen, uh, it's important that there are um, that this knowledge about how can we do this is used and uh, can be shared. 
And what I've also seen is that in this COVID period, there's a huge trust and reliance also on knowledge we have from science. That's quite a good thing, of course, but we also learned that that's not enough. That's not the only source of knowledge we need. So we need a combination between also expert knowledge and we also need a knowledge of uh, users, of civilians. That's very uh, important. And for instance, in the country, uh, in the Netherlands, we saw that, for instance, parents of young children got so scared uh, in the start of the COVID situation that they uh, uh, didn't let their children go to school. So there was no other option than to close the schools. So there was no scientific evidence to close schools, but our society just uh, did that. And I think that's very important because underneath what we are working on, um, there are a lot of values. And we see that if although you use different sources of knowledge, like science, expert knowledge and user knowledge, when you want to come to decisions and policies, you have to know what values there are and how you prioritize them. And that's um, an important uh, piece of study we're now working on. Um, Chira, Chira, can you now go to the next slide? Because um, if we um, uh, know, uh, have all this knowledge, then you should uh, think, okay, why don't we just do so? And if you look at how we can further develop uh, healthcare systems and uh, resolve uh, uh, fragmentation, um, then it's not just about organization or structures or processes or systems or policy. It's about people. It's about behavior. It's about how we do decision making. So we started some work about having a more grip about this more moral issues, you could say, or normative aspects of integration who are really close to the behavior of people. Why do people what they do and how do we make decisions? That's not uh, always a very um, uh, knowledge based, of course. And what we found in this new study, which will be released soon, which in which we cooperated with WHO, is that we found find that there are 18 values that lie underneath how we define good, integrated, adaptive uh, um, uh, uh, health systems. And these 18 values you see in this figure on the left, in the circle, on the uh, outside of the circle, you can say. Um, and what we found is this study in 42 countries in that, that these values are quite universal. They're quite, uh, they were recognized in all these countries, uh, although there are different contexts, different systems, different people, etc., etc. Still people say, okay, these values are really important. But when we searched further um, in our research, we found that although it should or lo uh, uh, it looked like that people think these, these are all important. When we asked them to prioritize these values, we found really differences between different stakeholder groups. So what we learned is that if you ask what's important uh, and you ask it to policymakers or to researchers or to professionals in practice, and we also included just civilians, users, uh, patients, whatever term you would like, they really prioritize in a different way what they think is important. So we think we, uh, we have the same view about what's important, but when we have to prioritize, people make other decisions. And that's very important. And we also saw differences uh, uh, in the different parts of Europe on what values are prior prioritized uh, as the most important. For instance, in the Nordic countries, we, for, we found more um, a priority uh, towards um, and values like having it in a co-production so and uh, 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 together with a client patient relationship and for instance in the more southern countries of Europe we found more emphasis on uh, um, values like efficient systems so and what this study shows us uh, we think is that it's very important to if we know how we can further develop what's important to really look from a broad perspective what peoples and communities need so that's really beyond care it's important not just to see what can you do, how can you organize it, but also on what kind of knowledge do you act? Do you make your decisions? Do you design your policies? What values are underneath? And be aware that these values are different for different stakeholder groups. So if you make policy only by policymakers, then you know that you're prioritizing in a certain way, which won't be maybe appealing to the public or to the professionals who work. So that's, I think, an important lesson, which is not the complete answer to your question, of course, but
but maybe contributes to some aspects which, in my opinion, so looking at scale issues, really have an issue about scale, looking at how can we design network governance and what values are underneath and how can we use them in our decision making, uh, can contribute a little to uh, the future and to the further development of healthcare settings and um, uh, communities. So thank Marilla, you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. So um, great to get that additional perspective. We're really building a story here. I mean, you said it's it's not the full answer. And I think what we're learning from this panel is we need a lot of people to be contributing to this discussion to get the answer. Um, Case has set the scene well, as you said, and then Joseph gave us that great overall understanding. You've, had, you've helped us see from a country level the different perspectives from scalability. I really like the stuff about values and it made me think values are not just different for people in general, but also in different times in your life, the values will change even for the same people, I suppose. Is that what you saw? Yeah, well, that, that's also, I think, correct. So um, what's the most important, and you you uh, just address it in another words, is that your personal perspective, where you are in your life, what your role is, that's that has influence of how you prioritize these values, which in general, we all agree on. But when we have to act, when we have to, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, show our behavior, we, th we, we are driven by those values. So that's very important to have a deeper understanding of that. Terrific, thanks. So let's think also now to another perspective. So also today with us, we have Marzena Nelken. She's a board member of the European Patients Forum and a board member of the Federation of Polish Patients. Hi Marzena, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, on the beginning, I would like to thank Ima for inviting European Patients Forum to the discussion. And I'm really very happy to be with you today uh, and to give some uh, insight from patients' perspective, the perspective uh, of the European patients' community. Uh, well, um, we are talking uh, about managing a sustainable and resilient healthcare systems. Um, and we are um, all the time referring uh, to the current COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, which is of course quite natural uh, as this pandemic has had and, and still has a tremendous importance uh, and impact on health uh, systems worldwide. Uh, but I would like to stress one very important thing in this regard, um, namely COVID-19 highlighted issues uh, the patient community have been already aware for uh, many years. So all these uh, problems of access to care, uh, like shortages, uh, inequalities, uh, uh, also in the digital health. So all these gaps uh, and weaknesses uh, in health systems have been exposed uh, by COVID-19, uh, but they uh, haven't been originated uh, in the crisis. Uh, so I think this is one important thing we should keep in mind. Um, COVID-19 experience uh, has also brought home uh, once again uh, the importance of uh, strong uh, European public health policy uh, and um, what has been mentioned uh, also uh, yesterday by several speakers, uh, the need of uh, collaboration on different levels. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, health system responses to the crisis uh, have already resulted in changes that patients uh, have hoped for many years would happen, uh, such as uh, virtual consultations, um, like uh, the access uh, to, uh, for patients and professionals uh, to our uh, online tools, uh, which enable them to communicate information, uh, like physician, uh, phys physicians' access to health records uh, from offsite, which wasn't the case practically anywhere uh, in the Europe, um, like home delivery of treatment uh, or medications. So all these things are really very positive aspects uh, of, uh, of the crisis. Uh, but um, this is unfortunately not yet the norm. 
uh, and uh, in our opinion, um, too few patients, especially patients with chronic conditions, uh, are benefiting from all these alternative solutions. So we are coming back here um, to these inequalities, which are uh, really very uh, much um, visible uh, on digita digitalization. Um, the digitalization has been dramatically accelerated by the pandemic situation, that's true, uh, and it has incredibly potential, uh, but there are still several issues uh, to tackle, and one of them is the access to telemedicine. Uh, I can give you uh, an example of uh, um, some countries uh, uh, where there are really huge differences uh, in access. Uh, like, uh, for instance, in Germany, uh, video consultations are uh, increasingly practiced. They are very much available for patients, uh, but not very far. In Bulgaria, for instance, telemedicine is currently not an option at all. Not an option uh, because it's, it's simply forbidden by the law. So practically all patients uh, who want to get their treatment, they have to go to hospital uh, and pharmacies. Uh, there is no other option for them. Uh, I can give you also an example uh, from Poland, um, the country I come from. Uh, we have uh, introduced uh, e-prescription and e-referral uh, lately. Uh, we are just about to introduce uh, a sick leave soon. Um, unfortunately, you are still missing this individual patient account, which would be really very helpful uh, for both uh, uh, professionals and patients. Uh, but uh, the access generally uh, to medicine uh, is still available. Although I can give you another example, uh, uh, which shows uh, very uh, clearly how the theory looks like uh, versus practice. Um, this is a very personal example uh, because um, it is an example of my grandmother uh, who is 94 years old. Uh, the old lady um, who a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, wanted to renew her prescription uh, for a drug uh, she has been taking for many years. Uh, so well, the procedure in Poland is that uh, in the current situation, uh, in such cases, uh, you have to contact uh, your clinic. Uh, because, of course, you don't have uh, the possibility to contact your di doctor directly. Uh, so uh, she tried to uh, to get in contact uh, to the clinic uh, for for a week uh, actually uh, because uh, uh, the phone uh, the line was uh, with all the time and it uh, uh, occurred very quickly that in the clinic there are only two doctors available uh, and each of them uh, gives uh, about seven consultations uh, by phone a day. And unfortunately, nobody in the clinic is allowed to renew the prescription. And of course, there is no chance to ask for one uh, by mail because nobody answers na uh, mails, especially from patients. So I think this situation shows uh, very beautifully um, how the, the, the system uh, can be successfully blocked. Uh, because uh, as we all know, uh, all these procedures uh, can be done uh, automatically uh, or can be solved different in different way to be more efficient. Uh, but in this case, uh, the, the system uh, uh, just blocks access to doctors for patients in real need for consultation, not only to renew the prescription, because you can imagine that my grandmother was, uh, wasn't the only one patient with this problem, yes, uh, with the of renewal her prescription. So there is again uh, a question of uh, exchanging information, of uh, sharing uh, best practices, uh, of uh, collaboration, uh, and uh, I think, um, at least to date, uh, we have not seen a systematic collection or, or sharing the best practices. Uh, for example, visual consultations or automatic prescription renewals, etc. Um, uh, 
as we believe that uh, this is one of the area uh, among many where the European Commission uh, could really support member states uh, with the involvement uh, of uh, patients' uh, organizations. Um, as we can see, uh, digital transformation is already happening. Um, it, it, it is happening. Uh, uh, but uh, we believe that in order to bring real value, uh, Europe's future digital health tools and, and all the systems uh, should start from patients' priorities. Uh, they should be uh, co-developed with patients, together with patients. Um, and we all know that digital health uh, is one of the areas where co-design is not yet, yet uh, well developed. The question is, do we really involve patients? Uh, uh, in this regard, I would like to share uh, uh, with you uh, the latest findings of a survey uh, carried out uh, by, uh, by EPF. Uh, this is a survey on um, the impact of COVID-19 on patients. is quite uh, clear uh, that patients uh, or their uh, representatives weren't involved in the management uh, of the pandemic. Uh, such answer was given by 70% of respondents all over Europe. I think that it says a lot. So theoretically, we all want to involve patients. Uh, uh, we all understand the necessity uh, and, uh, and benefits of, of involving patients in a garden. Maybe right now is the time where, uh, when we are talking about redesigning the system, uh, that uh, uh, we should uh, go from talking about something to doing it. Uh, in, in real life. And finally, I promise, um, there will be, uh, there is a lot of discussion on the importance of patient centered healthcare. Uh, but what this, what this really means, patient centeredness includes empowerment and involvement not only in patients' own care, which is also very important, but also as partners in policy and systems levels. And probably we have to convince anybody that uh, uh, such approach uh, brings significant benefits. Uh, the obvious one, the, the reduced healthcare costs, improved waiting times, but also wider societal benefits uh, around employment, increased community cohesion, and, and safety, of course, and not to mention Im improved outcomes for patients. So the message uh, is the idea of redesigning healthcare services on the principles of uh, patient empowerment which uh, will definitely bring us closer to more sustainable and resilient healthcare systems. Terrific. Thank you so much, Marzena. That was an incredibly insightful overview. You, you actually had a really clear connection. I know that you've been having a bit of trouble with your internet. Most of your talk was crystal clear. Just towards the end, some people might have had a bit of a... The, really, the last few seconds, it went a bit, um, hey, and that's when you were talking about the importance of patient-centeredness and that we need to be having better discussions about meaningful patient involvement and patient-centeredness that the terms have been around a while, but let's make sure we keep doing this properly. Is that is that effectively what you were saying at the end? I think you're on mute now, but it looks like you're agreeing. I'm gonna take that as a, you're still on mute. Is that just me that can't hear her? You, yeah, no one can hear. Okay, Marzena, I'm going to move on, but we're going to come back to you for the questions at the end anyway, so that we can um, um, we can we can get any other questions answered. Thank you, Marzena. And I'll remind the audience: if you've got any questions, do type them into the Q and A box. And at the end of these um, 
we uh, will have time for live questions as well. Uh, I'll also say that to the remaining speakers, we're, we're doing good for time. So, so next we come to Kim Putters. Kim, thank you so much for being with us today. You're the director of the Social and Cultural Planning Office uh, in the Netherlands, and you're a, a good friend of Emma. People would be well familiar with you if they've attended a conference before. Thanks for being here. Thank you, and thank you for, for inviting me. And we uh, agreed not to make you very nervous on top of the long, so I'll try to keep my, uh, my minutes as well. Uh, you've got you time, very... you've got time. <laughs> thanks to all the speakers and Case for his, um, his keynote. Uh, what I will try to do is uh, to take it uh, from a somewhat broader perspective. Uh, where do, do we come from? What does COVID bring us? And what does it mean for healthcare leadership? Uh, and I try to connect to the former speakers. Um, what I would like to start with is that I think what we have seen in a lot of European countries in the past decades is that we moved a little bit onwards from uh, well, a welfare state, you could say, with a lot of protection uh, and security uh, organized by governments towards more of a investment state in which we tried to stimulate people, activate people, with the help they need in order to uh, stay working on the labor market or uh, participate in society. So you could say a movement from the welfare state to the investment state. Um, with less government, at least in the Netherlands, that's the case, and I know of several European countries, uh, more focus on the self-reliance of patients and citizens and their social networks. I think that's also what we hear in the former uh, speeches and in, in cases um, uh, keynote. Um, so bringing healthcare somewhat more near the citizens, their direct environments, local governments, and try to organize it in a more activating way. But of course, and I would like to say something about that, is reasons from certain propositions underneath these welfare state policies that also influence what we can expect from those services and what we could expect from healthcare leaders, also in this period of COVID, and I will go into COVID in, in a minute. But what kind of propositions have we seen in the past concerning healthcare leadership? I think, first of all, uh, the self-reliance of patients and the way they could use their social networks has been a very important proposition in a lot of healthcare states, healthcare policies in all of our countries. Yet, and uh, my institute, the Netherlands Institute of Social Research, the SAP, has published a report earlier this week in which we noted that, well, this movement towards more self-reliance and more focus on social network, networks has also, well, been a little bit on the cost of the most vulnerable people. So who are the people that have social networks? Who are the people that have, well, digital capabilities to surf along the websites and choose their own provisions? The most vulnerable people in a society uh, are mostly alone, not too much of support, and they really need the services our governments or healthcare institutions provide. So the first proposition that the self-reliance is always there at place and the networks are always there at place is not always the case. So this is important also when I come to COVID later on, um, but this is the first proposition I would like to challenge and perhaps you have other experiences in your country. The second one is that if we come to uh, self-reliance social networks and link that to professional services, uh, the proposition has been that it could be integrated. So there could be integrated care combining formal and informal provision, combining what patients do themselves and what professional organizations can do. I think a lot of practices show that it's more difficult than that. So specialized services combining with more generalized services. I think Mirella also talked about, about well, what are the conditions you need to do that in a proper way. So the second proposition uh, of integrated care is not always in practice there yet. The third one is that a lot of our reforms in the past decades have been reasoning for more efficiency and less costs. So if we do it more integrated, if we have more self-reliance and more social networks in place, it could also be done more efficiently. And I also think that this third proposition is not always a reality as well. Of course, a lot of things go well in, in, in healthcare services, but these three propositions I would like to challenge today for what we uh, look ahead of us. 
what is the solution then, I think, and that's also the last presentation of Mazena, I think, I think it's really important in this moment of time to really reason from the people's needs. Um, if Joseph talks about more resilient, I think that comes very near to organizing our healthcare services, not only with a proposition or an ideal world of self-reliance and social networks, but really reasoning from the needs of people and well, also specifying the services they need. And that brings me to COVID. If this is what we come, where we come from in, in all kinds of different settings, but healthcare reforms uh, from protection to activation and to stimulating self-reliance, now we experience a crisis that is rather big. And that shows that, well, not all of our systems are really, uh, uh, well, ready to handle this type of crisis, as Joseph also said. My institute has started in, in March a big program on the societal effects of COVID in, in the Dutch society. And what we see there is, first of all, and I think that's also what Kees noted on, that um, we see old and new inequalities in people needing uh, for healthcare services. In the first place, we see, of course, the vulnerable people or the classical vulnerable people who are really depending on home care or youth care or, uh, well, social support, which was, was, was an urge in the COVID period on, up until now to strengthen those services, but they were not always there, of course. But these are the classical vulnerable groups. But I think that every one of us at the moment also experiences some loneliness, perhaps psychological stress, uh, perhaps the insecurity of losing a job. So in a way, um, the COVID crisis is a healthcare crisis that touches upon all of us. I think this is a challenge as well. Um, when it comes to psychological, to, to mental health care, I think we're now in a period of time that more people than ever understand how important psychological assistance can be or mental care can be. So it's a challenge as well. But, but my, my point here would be, that um, the COVID crisis shows that uh, the classical vulnerabilities in our society are still there and they are deepening also along educational level because we know the differences in life expectation and illnesses between the higher and the lower educated and these division lines they deepen I think due to COVID but my uh, added point would be we also see that more vulnerabilities are uh, uh, in, in at stake here, uh, people losing their jobs, needing psychological care. So it's a broader issue here not, than only the classical uh, division lines in society. Um, so the risk is deepening division lines. The risk is that our healthcare systems are not able to help all those people. Yet there are challenges as well, of course, because we see in all of our countries also that well, new digital assistance, uh, people organize new ways of solidarity. They try to take care of each other. New forms of cooperation between formal and informal care also appear at the moment. So it appears that a crisis also enforces us to be creative, to be innovative, and to look for new ways of organizing healthcare. So next to the risks, I would like to well, put into discussion what kind of challenges do we see here? And that brings me to my conclusion. So coming from those reforms we've already seen in the past decades, a crisis like COVID added to that, I think I see uh, at least four challenges and I will briefly mention them for healthcare leaders. The first one is then if there was ever a time that we have to connect quality of life issues and issues of illnesses and healthcare services to quality of uh, services, so quality of life, quality of care, so connecting the medical and social domain services, I think the moment is now. And I think we experience that all the time, all of us, not only the most vulnerable in society. So the first challenge for healthcare leaders is really connecting medical and social services. The second one is, well, try to, well, um, develop and be creative in new instruments and ways of working, as I just noted, but perhaps also renovating or re, uh, recovering old instruments. And just to mention one in, in the Dutch system, we have those kitchen table talks, we've introduced talks with people in the past decade, just to 
trace what's really their need. It's not only the medical need, but it's also loneliness. It's also the support of your family. So really have a broader talk about what's happening in your life and what's really the service you need. I think that was a very positive change in our healthcare system and we could try to improve those instruments. So the second challenge for healthcare leaders is I think improve what's working, but be creative on what we need now. The third one is that I really think that we have to have a debate about, about what is solidarity and self-reliance in all of our healthcare systems at this moment. Um, I think that it's about prioritizing who are the most vulnerable in society and who need healthcare services the most at this moment in time during COVID. But I think we have to keep in mind that we are head, heading towards a new kind of society in which also new vulnerabilities will be there and we, we, need, we need new definitions of solidarity leaders. Also the people losing jobs, it's also the new challenges for our mental care system. So that's the third one, the third challenge for healthcare leaders. And then the last one, and I'll end with that. And Joseph also pointed at that. I think that we as healthcare uh, researchers should really think through how to get all of our knowledge into the policy making system. Um, in my own experience in the past seven months, really cooperating very near with the Dutch government, I, sh I saw how much competition there is between epidemiological knowledge, social knowledge, uh, knowledge about our economy. And in these types of situations in we are in now, I think there is so much knowledge in our healthcare system about the needs of the people. And we need to have new interfaces between the policy making and uh, our knowledge in all of our uh, different disciplines. Um, so I hope people have some uh, new and innovative, innovative ideas about how to do that as well. Um, did I spend more time than I got, <laughs> George? No, Kim, okay. uh, that was perfect. <laughs> that was perfect. And actually, the same with every one of the speakers. I, I'm, I'm sure, like, like the rest of the audience, I'm sure would feel the same. We want to hear more. We wish this session could be even longer and, and there'll be a chance for some questions and answers. So if people do have questions and answers, do put them in. Um, there's been a lot of talk about integration and there's a question about integration that we'll get to a bit later. And I'll also remind people that there's another session on integration. I'll, just, I'll check the details, but I think that's to, uh, today. Uh, I think after this, in fact, um, but I'll check the details on you uh, for everyone if you want to hear more about that. Um, Kim, you covered, you covered so many things. One of the things that stood out to me actually was around getting all of the voices heard in policy. And what's been interesting for us as a health management association is that the very time that they're doing crisis policy discussions about health management is the very time that health managers are not available to be part of that discussion where decisions about their work is being, is being decided. So it'd be great to hear more from the panel and from the audience about what, how can we improve mechanisms so we can make sure that health managers' voices are being heard by decision makers? Um, so let's go on to our last speaker and then um, we'll come back to the questions. Uh, Lil uh, Sverestater Larsen, she's the president at the Norwegian Nurses uh, Organization, a, a longtime member of, of EMA. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, you're going to give us the insight about, um, about the nurses' experience and what nurses can be doing in these times. Thank you, George uh, and uh, Ima for, the, um, for this interesting uh, session and for inviting me as well. Uh, the gap between the society's needs and expectations in healthcare and the resources in healthcare, um, uh, healthcare systems available are well known uh, in Europe and also in, uh, in Norway as well. Thus, the pandemic is an acute crisis on an already ongoing crisis when it comes to the global experience of severe shortage of, uh, of nurses and uh, healthcare workers. So let me start to uh, congratulate all nurses with 2020. This is the year of the nurse and midwife as announced by WHO. It, it, it was supposed to be the year to celebrate the nursing competence. However, the pandemic made 2020 the year where the whole world uh, has understood the nurses uh, vital skills. The shortage of nurses has a direct impact on the capacity and quality of uh, our health systems 
Uh, and this limited capacity has been a key factor behind decisions, the uh, authorities' decisions to, to uh, lock down societies, both in Norway and in other uh, countries as well. This has hit our economies hard and will eventually also threaten many countries' um, abilities to secure enough funding of their healthcare systems in the future. So it is crucial for the society as we know it to learn from this situation and to create resilient and sustainable health systems. So in my opinion, there are three factors of utterly importance. First, we need to build a strong, autonomous and competent workforce of nurses. This means uh, to ed educate uh, the proper level of nurses, that employers need to take better care of their health workforce. That includes proper PPE as personal protective equipment, um, health uh, promoting working conditions, and also that the task shift and skill mix between several professions and technology as well are carried out correctly. Um, State of the World Nursing Report shows that there is a global shortage of nurses, estimated uh, at 5.9 million nurses globally. In Norway, the shortage is about 6,000 nurses. Uh, sorry. Um, 6,000 nurses is a high number for us, uh, and the shortage is increasing. In fact, the Norwegian healthcare system depends on autonomous nurses and specialist nurses, which have, uh, which has, um, who has uh, master degrees in EG anesthesiology, intensive care, surgery, uh, gerontology and many other fields of expertise and they play a crucial and independent role within patient care in our hospitals and in municipalities. Norway has one of the world's highest survival rates uh, within uh, intensive care and respiratory treatment and research shows that specialist nurses play a vital role in this achievement. According to take good care of health workforce in Norway, we experience that the focus on health, safety and environment is actually stronger in the industry sector, e.g. oil industry, than within the, the healthcare sector. I guess that probably is recognizable for several of you as well. So it's time to acknowledge that there is a strong connection between the work environment of employees and patient safety. And that brings me on to the second point. We need to ensure a strong and competent leadership on all levels. There will be, there will, there will be no resilience uh, or sustainability without a strong and competent nurse leadership that ensures that nurses are represented, rep represented at the strategic level in both hospitals, municipalities, and at the national level. WHO recommends that all countries to appoint a, job in, uh, a government chief nursing CNO and midwife officer. We experience a lack of leadership function at the, the government le level to help gather, filtrate, and coordinate policy inputs from the nursing services and bring this to the political table. And as you know, nurses constitute the largest part of the healthcare workforce, not uh, only in Norway, but in all countries, the largest part of, health, of the healthcare uh, workforce. So the nursing services are vital in any health uh, systems and they're most often led by a nurse. So nurse leaders are therefore key stakeholders in achieving resilient and sustainable health systems. So in my opinion, both EMA and the European Observatory should engage more in um, the importance of nursing, nurses and leadership. We need to invest in young leaders and we need to find them, train them and nurture them in order to achieve uh, in fact, resilient and sustainable health systems. So third, we need to uh, build on a strong publicly funded uh, healthcare system. To me, a sustainable and resilient healthcare system is a system which offers universal health coverage and accessible and a high quality health and care services to the whole population. I believe that both public funding and provision of health and uh, care services are vital in order to secure a resilient and uh, sustainable health system support. We need systems that people can trust on, where knowledge-based decisions and ethics are in front, and where business uh, interests, profits, has a really, really low profile. 
So we must secure that people with the highest needs can access and receive the treatment and care they need. And we need to secure that our healthcare personnel are being used to provide healthcare to severely ill patients. I believe that the public funding and provision of healthcare is a prerequisite for, uh, for achieving this. So, George, sum it up. Build a strong, autonomous, and competent workforce of nurses. Two, ensure a strong and competent leadership on all levels. And three, a strong, publicly funded healthcare system. Because there is always a crisis coming towards us. Now it's a pandemic, it's always a crisis uh, coming towards us. And we need to work together for our, resi for our resilient uh, healthcare systems to be able to retain a sustainable society. So thank you, and I look uh, forward, forward to further discussion. Thank you very much, Lil. Um, just picking up on your last point, that there's always a crisis. Uh, we were preparing our rapporteurs who are covering the, the conference. And so for the rapporteurs who are here in the room, thank you for joining us and thank you for doing all the great reporting that you're doing. They'll share their reports with you over the next month. And I read last year's rapporteur report and you could have written it now. It talked about crisis, it talked about shortages, it says health systems need to change now. We're not, we can't keep going this way. It read as if it was written today. So um, I think that's a great point that really, for me, highlights the point that there's always going to be an issue. So then this, this panel is about, well, what do we do about this? And so um, you guys have given some great ins uh, insights. Now I look to the audience. It's time for your questions. Like I said, you can type it into the Q&A box. We've got one there already from Dr. Anthony perez Grau, And um, I'm just going to look to see if anyone's hand is up. Um, not as yet. Um, Joseph, if, you're, um, if you don't mind, I want to come back to you for just your first general reflection, because you started us with an, an overview, and um, on reflection now, having heard from the rest of the speakers, what does that add to your perspective? Uh, a lot, actually, a lot. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the views of our, uh, the, the perspectives of our colleagues. Perhaps to start with the question of Tony Anthony Perry, which is absolutely core and Kim has highlighted it beautifully, and I may say so, which is social support, uh, societal support, societal determinants has been always central to our work. But COVID once again has put that, has hit us on the face. Are we surprised? Why are we still surprised that there's so little compliance when uh, populations, vulnerable populations don't have any social support at home? no financial incentives to take any quarantine, no uh, complexities in access, and all of you have talked about access. Um, Lil was highlighting that beautifully well about UHC, uh, when the access to those services, not only health services, but also social, so social services are not there. Why would you uh, go and get a test? Why would you go into quarantine while your income depends on that? Where is the support if you're living in overcrowding situation to be able to quarantine yourself? So, Antonio, you're absolutely right. Uh, actually, I was talking to one of the directors of the health service in Catalonia about that, uh, your own uh, part of the world, Antonio. And if we do not do that, there's no way we're going to control the epidemic. Uh, I love very much also what Mireille was saying about values. And I think we failed entirely in understanding the values. You did that, Mireille. I mean, for the love of God, we need to understand the need of the Dutch to be different, to have the personal choice in COVID, not only in integrated care. We need to understand the version of the bridge on the, around the issues of nanny state. We need to understand the Swedish. The Swedish colleagues did not adopt that policy only because they're Swedish and they are different, partially because of that, but also because of the context, because they have values, because they cannot, their constitution doesn't allow to impose in their, in their citizens certain restrictions. So yet an importance of values, certainly the citizens, but Marzena there, I'd like to uh, remind you and remind us why now again, we need to remind ourselves again, and I'm sorry to be such a, a repetition, uh, George, that when citizens, patients take over, take responsibility, we get better results. I can quote you study after study after study where patients' involvement is not only for satisfaction, is not only for their own responsiveness, but is bloody, excuse me, is very cost-effective, very efficient. They use less resources 
and get better outcomes. And on your question, and I'll stop here, uh, George, you know, it's not quite true. During this, um, during this pandemia, we've seen what Repullo, a friend from Spain, Professor Repullo said the other day, there's been beautiful alliances between the Thai and the white coat. The Thai being the manager, Thai actually have a nice tie today, George, uh, of the managers and the white coat. We've seen flexibility, we've seen involvement, we've seen really changing pathways, restructuring, because they had the freedom and the space. When you give the managers the space, they bloody react. They bloody do things, they had to do it. We've seen pathway changes in primary care, amazing changes. And going down back to Lil, just to go the, the whole round, Lil, absolutely, the observatory is published, yet another study on a skill mix on the importance of nursing. But you see, it's all about implementation. It's all about the politics. It's the changes in culture. How do you get nurse practitioners? How do you get their role much more involved? Because the cost effectiveness evidence is there. And now during the COVID, Lil, once again, we've seen many, I used to be a medical doctor many years ago, not only the evidence I read, but doctors are saying it's beautiful how now the teams on COVID are totally equal not only between different specialties, but with the nursing. It's really side by side. And nurses are more effective often in these situations of search, of creativity that the doctors are. Why do we need the COVID to remind ourselves, preach again and go back to the next crisis? That I'm worried about, George and colleagues. And somehow I'm becoming more and more of, uh, I don't like to say that but because I'm into evidence and to evidence to practice and so on. But I feel more, much more I've been an activist because it's too many years listening to the same things, colleagues, and yet not implementing and seeing 250,000 deaths in the US and uh, similar numbers in the US, in, in, the, in our uh, old continent, and still talking about the same things. Colleagues, we have to wake up. So, um, Joseph, I mean, that's the question. Why do, why, why do we need this? Essentially, that's why we're here to say, why, why do we need this? Your question is right. And I, know, and I think what the panel have been saying is there isn't a straightforward answer to that. But I want to start to see what can we really do? I actually want to turn to Marzena and ask um, a slightly different perspective question, which is, Marzena, we're talking a lot about patient involvement and better patient connectedness. Has the idea of patient changed, like the definition or understanding of it changed, given that we have such a, an easily communicable uh, virus, transmittable virus at the moment? Is the concept of patient changing? Uh, thank you, Joseph, for this question. Uh, well, uh, I think um, this is uh, exactly what Kim mentioned before, uh, we did change uh, uh, something uh, in our community. Uh, generally, it's not only applicable to patients, but generally to people, uh, because we started communicating uh, on uh, video calls, uh, by phones. There are lots of initiatives uh, also from patients' perspective how to make uh, the access more available, how to, um, you know, solve the problems of uh, uh, each uh, personal, uh, uh, very, uh, let's say, um, uh, sometimes easy problems uh, locally uh, even. Uh, so um, there is a, a, a discussion, a very important, how to uh, um, improve okay, Mirella, uh, models, how now we just started doing the covenant and how we can how, how we can oh. learn from it. Ah, oh, sorry to be interrupting you, Marzena. Your your um, connection was crackling again, but we did we did hear your response. We've got a few more questions now. Um, we've got one from Federico Lega, Professor Lega from uh, University of Milan asks, COVID crisis seems to have relaunched the role of community and family nurses as the linking pin between health and social services. Might we finally be uh, with chance to strengthen capacity to do an effective population health management. So um, Lil, can I come to you first? And then Marilla, I might ask uh, for your input. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's happens uh, something important in the, in the municipalities and in the family care uh, nursing perspective as well. 
I would like to um, draw an example. Uh, the Norwegian Nurses Organization has taken an initiative towards the Ministry of Health to launch and facilitate a project on better skill mix in both specialized and primary healthcare. We believe that the time and competence of both nurses and doctors and under nurses as well can be used for more than efficiently if you secure a better skill mix and distribution of tasks. And then we need to, we need to ask this question. We need to, <laughs> we need to discuss it with each other. Um, so nurses are vital to better coordination of treatment and care to each patient, both in hospitals, but of course also in the primary healthcare sector. So, um, hmm. and, and, we, and we see a lot of examples uh, already. We are uh, sampling uh, examples uh, for now. And uh, we see outpatient clinics for patients with um, atrial fibrillation fibril and heart failure, for example. And also follow-up patients with pacemakers, with uh, diabetes, with calls, etc. So it's happening and it's uh, happening faster, uh, more faster, more faster and increasing uh, collaboration between, um, between doctors and, uh, and, uh, and nurses uh, because of the pandemic. And that's a great thing. Thanks. So, Lil, I want to ask you one more thing before I go to Mirella, which is Dr. Grau adds another question saying that nurses are basically everywhere, but maybe most in primary care. Nevertheless, in many European countries, some lobbies, maybe doctors, are in opposition of them treating patients or prescribing. Is that what you're seeing across your region or around mm -hmm. other networks? I guess uh, that's a difference uh, between uh, the, uh, the, um, the countries. Uh, in Norway, we have... Um, we have about equal. Actually, we have more nurses in in hospitals than in the primary healthcare sectors. But the shortage of nurses are larger in the primary healthcare sectors. So that's exactly why we have initiated initiated this uh, project because we need to uh, see nurses go between the, the sectors, between hospitals and 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 uh, and uh, primary healthcare sectors, and we need to uh, speak about the task uh, sk uh, skill mix and and the tasks that they are. Uh, they're doing. We can't have nurses' competence from bachelor or master degrees that actually are going to do cleaning work or maintenance or something. It has to be the nursing competence that comes first. Okay. George, so, can I come in briefly on that, very, very briefly on this question? Uh, as I said earlier, very quickly in a rush, I apologize. We just finished this research on the skill mix, the role of nurses, but other professionals. And we started to work about assessing innovation, assessing involvement, leadership in integrated care, the role of nurses and other professionals, social workers and so on. But then as we evolved in the project, a lot of the research has been on the political economy, on the implementation, on the changes in cultures, the nurses themselves wanting to take really, if I may, may say, new leadership role, the doctors accepting that. Norway, in particular, talking to your policymakers, Norway is very much part of the observatory, a country from whom we learn an awful lot. Even in Norway, it hasn't been that straightforward in primary care to get nurses, you know, I may say so, at the same uh, taking over from some of the roles that they do much better than doctors. So a lot of that is culture, culture, culture. Let's remind ourselves. It's no rocket science or the evidence of nurses taking a, a bigger role. We have all the evidence of them prescribing, all the evidence on, on giving health promotion advice, of running integrated care, and so on and so on and so forth. Over. Thank you. I'm going to go to Mirella, and I'll say to the other panelists, there's a few more questions coming through, and we won't have time for them. If you don't mind typing answers to the ones that you feel you could, that would be great. So, yeah. Mirella, you, you talked yeah. about scalability. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, it's, it's a, good, a good observation and good question, because in my opinion, I think supported health and social services in the broader sense of health, right? so in the broad definition of health, is building on strong uh, communities and social cohesion in communities, um, in which it's very important to have a, a broad vision about what are the needs of people. And what we see is that nurses specifically um, are trained to have a kind of a broad view and look at a person in uh, his or her, uh, her context and see what is needed. Uh, I think that's the, 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 the knowledge that uh, uh, besides the specialized nurses, for instance, on a specific topic or ICU or whatever kind of specialization, we have a lot of community nurses who do have a feeling and a sense of what's happening in the situation. What's the context? So they have a broad view, and I think that's important. That's a cornerstone. That's a basic of um, uh, uh, fulfilling the needs of people. 
and uh, seeing what kind of connections you have to make or what kind of support you have to offer besides having specialized care, etc. Because we know that a lot of issues, especially in these times, are not that specifically really uh, 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 treatment, I could say, cure related. So I think nurses can have a very important role in that and are kind of the cornerstone of good and solid uh, uh, health systems. Thank you, uh, Marilla. I want to thank uh, Ellie Breedveld, Paul Pultveld, uh, sorry for that mispronouncing, Tina Tuonen, Sandra Budige for your questions. We're going to try and answer them in text, but we're going to wrap up in just a few minutes. Uh, Kim, I want to come back to you and then Case, I also want to um, come back to you as well. Uh, Kim, there's a particular question for you on um, from, from Paul Pultvliet. Pultvliet. Um, he agrees with you, as you know, but since since we cannot since we cannot provide more care, which care can we allocate towards the most vulnerable? I was just trying to type to a foul point. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for, for the question. Well, um, I think that we really have to understand first the dynamics of this crisis. So it started as an epidemiological health crisis. Uh, it became an economic crisis, and it's now uh, really strengthening towards a social crisis. And we all know, and we, especially within Emma and our organizations, that the effects of what is happening now on the social relationships in society and on our health will be there for the coming years. So the inequalities will grow. The strengthening of the social and health effects will be there in the coming years. So first of all, I think we have to align the short and longer term agendas of our policymakers. They have to, and so I was very much triggered by Joseph to be more activist. I think we really have to enforce that the short term decisions being taken now have to take into account the longer term social and health effects for the coming years. That's the first thing. And then coming to Paul's question, yes, I, I think it's inevitable that in the coming years, at least in the Dutch case, uh, we call it the social domain, there will be needed more investments to, to tackle all the health, the mental health issues and the social health issues. So I think one, one, lack, uh, one solution is, is, is the money and organizing it. The other one I mentioned in my talk is, I think we have to be creative in how to align all different kinds of services, social, health, in neighborhoods. So I think there's also a lot of creativity uh, in the past uh, period that we could use to do new things. It's not only about the money, but I do understand this is a difficult issue here. Yeah. I, I hope you. that's part of, of an answer to his question. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. Um, Case, can I come Case, can I come to you for the last uh, comment? One of the things that really stood out is having voices heard, and you're an expert on voices being heard or not heard. Um, do you have any final thoughts on that? Uh, well, we had uh, almost a year ago a meeting from the European Patient Forum on, let's say, engagement, patient engagement. And then I mentioned that uh, a year ago uh, I compared the patient movement at that time with the patient movement in the 80s, 90s. And then we had ACT UP with a lot of AIDS activists. And uh, I mentioned that I surely was missing that at the moment. And uh, mm. that is something I think that uh, is also a point of discussion now. It was an article in the BMD last week about the fact that almost no governments consulted, consulted the patient community about the COVID crisis. And not only to handle the COVID crisis, but also to handle the delayed access to care issue. And I think we can say the same from the organizations for the elderly. Uh, the situation in nursing homes, it has been very bad. And I think that between the first and the second wave, there were all kinds of initiatives to evaluate how we handled the first wave. But the second wave came so quick that it looks a little bit like we have now a much more authoritarian approach to go further with all kinds of lockdowns where we forgot to consult the patients, the elderly and the citizens. So we also have seen a number of demonstrations 
where let's say people express uh, their attitude that they feel at unease with what's going on. And I think um, the National Patient Federation, the EPF, uh, and the elderly groups com combined in Age Europe, they should make a much stronger statement to European Commission that has been done already, but especially to the national member states to be much more involved in policies and to tackle what has been uh, described in this symposium as the disconnect between the health and the social services and to find solutions together with the community of citizens where let's say the patient community is part of. Great, thank you very much for the uh, keys. So um, we're over time and I need to wrap up, but I've got a few important housekeeping things to say. Like there's been so many um, Pandora's boxes open in this discussion. And this is what this conference is about, having these discussions, having these debates and getting a chance to speak more. Thank you very much, George. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody.